Thanks very much, um, Deborah and Chelsea, for organizing this. And I might ask Chelsea to um, put my slides up because she has learned both with our recording that um, one of the realities that feminists have long known is that abilities to silence through recording or not recording and abilities to control technology are actually pretty important tools. So my name is Natasha Affolder and I'm a law professor who works on environmental issues through a transnational law lens. I was bit by the feminist bug or infected by the powerful intellectual force that is feminist legal thought. I think you can choose your own metaphor or come up with a better one um, in law school. And like a number of other scholars in this faculty, the subject matter of my scholarship may not be always about a topic that is considered feminist, but my methods certainly are. And Chelsea, maybe we can move to the next slide. I wanted to speak for a moment about methods, and you lost the picture here, um, because I think a number of you are probably thinking about careers in various legal fields where you're wondering, how will your interest in and passion for feminist advocacy and feminist thought make a difference in your likely day job? And the short answer I wanna give you is it will. Approaching the world through a feminist lens or multiple lenses makes a difference to all the work I do, whether it's reading an environmental indemnity agreement and analyzing a specific clause or reading the entire text of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Law favors abstractions, and feminist scholarship constantly reminds us to illuminate the people behind those abstractions and to also notice the ones who are invisible or not there at all. And maybe we can move to the next slide. In my current work, I'm interested in explaining why we have the environmental law that we do today. This involves trying to explain the marginalized place that environmental protection imperatives occupy in law outside this tiny rarefied field called environmental law. It also demands grappling with the fact that social issues related to resource use and extreme poverty are largely not concerns of the environmental law that has developed. So as a result, we need to ask, what sort of environmental law has been created, by whom, and whom does it serve? A large part of that question traces to the idea that environmental law ideas actually move rather than are static. So something I'm currently looking into, which this um, slide reveals, is how Canadian experiences shaped global discourses about the use of gender-based analysis plus methods in international environmental impact assessment. And now it's time to inquire how these globalized um, experiences translate back into the way that gender-based assessment is going to happen under Canada's federal impact assessment legislation. And since I saw Jennifer Koshen um, in the chat box, I can shout out to her work here because she's done an important um, piece looking at the idea of gender-based um, acknowledgements in the 2019 Impact Assessment Act that's definitely worth reading. For my research, what this involves grappling with is issues as diverse as to what extent is feminist internationalism still haunted by what Anne Orford calls the shadows of the 19th century feminists whose key role was to facilitate empire, to what happens when feminist authored guidelines on gender sensitive impact assessment get translated into practice by the institution of Vancouver commercial law firms. If I had to boil this all down to a simple point, and I think one of the joys of feminism is that we like to complexify, we like to add nuance and richness, um, we like to illuminate questions that aren't being asked and it's harder to make everything simple. But if I was forced to come up with a simple takeaway, it would be this. We need to pay close attention to legal ideas before they reach the point of legislation and case law.
legal ideas matter much, much earlier than this. Thanks, and I think over to Professor Arbel. Hello, can you hear me? Great. Uh, it's a pleasure to join. My apologies for being late. One of the things I do as a feminist is uh, run around uh, between work and uh, childcare duties. So uh, it's nice to join a few minutes behind. Thanks for hosting us, Deborah, and thank you all for assembling today. Um, so I thought in preparation for this, what will I say? And I thought that I will speak for a minute about what feminism means to me and then um, speak a little bit to a recent project uh, of mine uh, that focused on, on much of my kind of feminist work. So feminism for me is a commitment and a methodology. And it's a commitment to um, ensuring that whatever work I do, um, that the work strives to ensure that people of all genders thrive. Um, and it's taken me a while to realize that, that my commitments aren't actually um, limited to, to where I thought they were before. So when I started my work, I really thought it was about equality or about equity, ensuring that uh, people of all genders have fair, um, equal treatment under the law. Um, and as my work has developed, I'm realizing more and more that that's actually not enough, that feminism for me is really about ensuring that people of all genders thrive and that the law is structured in a way that allows them to do that. The methodology, um, you know, really changes according to where I am in my work, but um, at its core is a commitment to remaining mindful of gender at all times. And that might seem sim simple. Um, and in fact, it kind of is, though it leads to very kind of complex points of inquiry. Um, too often the law um, obscures gender. And by asking the simple question of where is gender, um, a lot more comes to the surface, a lot more uh, becomes seen. And so while again, my methodological orientations might change depending on which area of law I'm in and depending on what it is that I'm doing, it's that, it's that kind of central kernel that, that, um, that anchors my methodology in my work. So I too am a law professor here at the Allard School of Law. I work uh, primarily in refugee law and in prison law. And in both uh, fields of law, I'm attracted to what I often um, refer to as liminal spaces, places that are kind of in between. So principally the border, the detention center, and the prison. And these are three areas where um, the law um, operates in very clear ways, but also areas where it's often kind of difficult to trace where exactly the law is. Um, and oftentimes gender gets kind of lost in the mix. Um, these three sites, the detention center, the border, and the prison are um, constructed from the perspective of law with a very, um, very much a, a focus on and a, a commitment to law and order and securitization and security. And oftentimes those concepts fail to understand what gender is, how it's experienced, and how it's manifest. Um, my work uh, uh, kind of spans a, a variety of different areas, but I'll speak a little bit to a project that I just um, completed. So this is a, a project that I worked on last year with the assistance of three JD students at, uh, at the Allard School of Law uh, that we uh, uh, wrapped up in August, um, just not too long ago. And this was a research report, an independent research report that um, was commissioned by the Canada Border Services Agency to examine how immigration detention responds to gender-based violence. And the specific question um, that, that the Canada Border Services Agency asked was how, how do the legal approaches um, uh, reflect uh, trauma-informed practices? And so it was a fascinating project where we got to really delve into the mechanics of immigration detention. Our focus was just on the legal framework, not uh, the lived experience of detention, though that's a future project of mine. 
Um, and very interestingly, we were able to examine Canada from a comparative perspective. So looked at different jurisdictions around the world, how they implement their immigration detention regimes and how they respond to and address gender violence within those regimes. Our focus was on um, cis women and trans women and their experiences within detention. Um, and uh, we uh, had the, the good fortune of being able to really delve into trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed insights to analyze immigration detention from this lens. And it was fascinating work in that it really brought to light um, so much about gender that often um, is, is obscured, particularly in these kinds of places in, in detention centers or other centers of government. Uh, and it's uh, fascinating to me um, to, to so, uh, kind of look at the ways in which my feminist methodologies and my feminist commitments are manifest differently in academic work versus um, applied legal work. And to be able to, to kind of weave the two together and move from work that is primarily scholarly in its nature to work that is really designed to be um, received and implemented by government. Um, and then to translate those two and arrive at, we were able to make 10 recommendations for law reform um, and to think about how, how those feminist commitments and methodologies can weave their way and in and out of those and anchor those um, recommendations as well. So I think my time is up. Um, I'll hand it over to uh, my next colleague. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Barkaskis, um, Pensy. I'm Métis uh, from Alberta, and I want to acknowledge that I live and work as an uninvited guest um, on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people here in Vancouver, BC. So that's the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam people. Um, my work primarily finds me both at Allard Hall, um, which is specifically Musqueam territory, and also uh, in the downtown east side, which is both um, the, ter the overlapping territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam, and home of uh, thriving urban indigenous uh, community that I also want to make sure that I acknowledge as well. Um, so I think even in my introduction, you can see that um, that my perspective as a Métis woman informs my um, my work and everything that I uh, everything that I do. And in fact, you know, was part of what brought me to law school to begin with my desire to do work for um, for Indigenous people and to find more tools and more instruments to help unravel or push back against the power structure that entrenches and reifies injustice is really what brought me um, from my, my deeply sort of both activist and academic Indigenous feminist background um, into, into law school to try to find ways to move forward in that work. And I think that it's fair to say that um, in grounding myself in feminism um, as, a, as an Indigenous woman, as a Métis woman who is a queer, bisexual, femme-identified um, Indigenous person, that I really, um, you know, I use feminism every day and it's the way that I live. It is literally, you know, the old adage, it is the personal and the political every day for me in my life. And in the work that I do in um, research um, that I bring to pedagogy and teaching um, and that I use in my law practice because I'm still a practicing lawyer. So um, in supervising students and teaching them at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic um, here at Allard, I really inform my approach um, through an Indigenous feminist lens we look at the ways that Indigenous women and um, 2S LGBTQIAA people are affected differently by law and legal policy and legal practice, um, and also the institutions that work with the law hand in hand. So um, my colleague, Professor um, Arbel already talked about you know, the institution of the prison, um, the institution of the police is another way that that Indigenous um, peoples are differently affected. And then depending on on 
who those Indigenous people are um, differently affected again. So looking at the ways in particular that um, Indigenous women are are negatively impacted by colonialism, by colonial policy, and by Canadian legal systems is something that um, something that I've been able to do in my research and also um, in the courtroom, which I think is a really, really powerful way to bring feminism to bear on people's everyday lives and the outcomes within um, the Canadian legal system for them. So an example of that um, specifically would be in our work at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic, for example, we see a lot of cases of um, what are called K-files or domestic assaults, where Indigenous women are actually charged for um, assaulting their partners when they have been the person who has called the police. So in the majority, in fact, of our domestic assault cases um, that come to the clinic, we are dealing with cases where Indigenous women have been um, involved in a violent encounter. They have called the police. And when the police come, they arrest that woman instead of the man who she called the police about. Um, and when that happens, we have a real opportunity um, to bring that truth forward to the court to talk about the fact that in these cases, um, it's not even pro-charging because the man isn't being charged at all, actually. Um, it's, it's just simply uh, injustice. And so we have an opportunity to actually advocate on behalf of those women and talk about the way that this is a systemic issue, to talk about the way that this is a structural issue, to talk about the fact that this happens every day and we literally see it every day at the clinic. Um, I can I can tell you that most of those cases don't go to court, that most of them receive stays of proceedings. Um, but at the end of the day, they should never have been charged in the first place. These women should never have had to go through that experience. And in fact, when they call the police, they should be the person who's protected. Um, and so using, using um, real life examples like that, I'm able to advocate to government, for example, in work that I do, um, that I'm privileged to do, for example, on the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliations, Minister's um, Advisory Council of Indigenous Women here in BC, where we advise government on issues. And I'm able to bring that real life experience of Indigenous women, that injustice, to those tables and talk to people who make policy and who make legislation um, and make them aware of these things. So that's just one example of the way that um, that I utilize my feminism uh, in the work that I do to advocate for Indigenous women. And I will turn it over to my next colleague. Hi everybody, it is, uh, it's such an honor to be here. My Wi-Fi has been a bit wonky all day, so just wave frantically if you can't, uh, if you can't hear me or I freeze up. Uh, my name is Alexandra Flynn and I'm an assistant professor here at Allard. I joined in 2019 um, and I'm uh, and that was the time that I, I moved to Vancouver as well. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm here on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, I'm also uh, speaking to you from my 15 year old son's uh, bedroom. Uh, so uh, this really speaks to a core part of, um, of me, which I'll, I'll describe in just a moment. Um, so I, I'd like to just very briefly situate myself as a scholar and then, um, and then tell you a little bit about how I think my scholarship intersects with feminism. So I study law in cities. Um, I attribute uh, this area kind of like an apple um, where, you know, periodically I take different bites out of the apple um, in this quest, hopefully, you know, sometime in 20 or 30 years where I'll have consumed, you know, even a reasonable chunk of it um, uh, on things that interest me about this, uh, you know, kind of fascinating phenomenon of cities, which don't nest very easily into a particular discipline of law in the way that many, many first year law students, for example, study it. Um, but this interest of mine comes out of my own experiences, comes out of my own experiences as a cisgendered woman um, growing up in small towns in Canada's north mainly, including Nunavut, and then also uh, living in, in big cities, including New York, um, San Francisco, Toronto, 
Um, and then in addition, my work as a, as a lawyer and as a policy manager, where I was before I became an academic. Um, my work is also greatly informed by who I am as a human being. Um, I'm, a, I'm a mom, I'm a partner, I'm a sister, I'm a, a daughter, and I'm a friend. And so all of these things affect how I bring my lens to, to think about the legal questions that I'm, um, that I'm interested in. Um, I also believe that there's not just what I'm interested in, but also the urgency of legal issues that, that come to me, um, which I'm very privileged to be in a position to, to think about. Um, and I think many of my scholars would agree that when we um, take an interest in law in its broadest sense, um, we hear about, we pay attention, we hear about, we become a source of contact for uh, phenomenon, legal phenomenon that take place. Um, that require our intervention. Um, and so that's another reason why my, my bites of the apple are, are, seem quite uh, disparate sometimes. Um, my, my very early work focused on the city of Toronto as a, a, a kind of a, a strange kind of government that on one hand was constrained by law and on the other hand needed to find a way to engage or should have found a way to engage with the broad range of people that live within its boundaries. And so my first work really came out of a big question that I found in my, uh, my work at the City of Toronto, where I felt that there wasn't a lot of attention to the voices that weren't heard, uh, the usual suspects that usually come to City Council or what have you, um, which often includes women and often include um, very vulnerable people. And so that early project was interested in that question. How can a city govern itself well um, with participatory, um, uh, uh, participatory mechanisms to ensure uh, that diverse voices are heard? More recently, especially since I've joined this wonderful legal community, I focused on Indigenous municipal relationships and also the, um, the governance of property of precariously housed people. So those are my, the two projects that at the moment are giving me, um, I think, the most uh, um, access to feminism, interestingly, even though neither of them has feminism in the title. And that's because both of them, both of these most recent projects are really about where the law and the books, what's written down, what you're all becoming experts in as students, um, what, how the law in the books doesn't explain fully what's really happening when decisions are made in cities. Um, and so that, though, these projects that I'm interested in are, are, have to go beyond what's written um, in statutes, in bylaws, in policy pieces, to actually ask people on the ground how they experience um, what happens within their city spaces. And so feminism has been profoundly important to me as a scholar, but also as a human in recognizing that, uh, recognizing intersectionality, recognizing overlap of rules and, and that there is an affect, there is a meaning that, that, that occurs even if um, the written law doesn't take account of it. But I just wanna conclude with one other way and I really welcome your questions after my wonderful colleagues have had a chance to speak. But I wanna speak about another, another area where feminism has been greatly inspiring and that's in regard to collaboration. So I've been extremely fortunate to collaborate with a bunch of scholars, policy practitioners, legal clinics, um, and, uh, and people who are trying to affect change uh, at the grassroots level. And as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about how 95% of the people that I collaborate with, that's not an exact number, but it's an approximate that I think is quite right, are women. Um, and so collaboration as a scholar has been, has been a profound way that feminism, I think, has touched on my own identity as a legal scholar, as somebody who is um, able to um, work with others to understand uh, more broadly the subjects that I think I understand, if that makes any sense. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there so that my next colleague can talk about their experiences, but I just want to really thank you so much, uh, 106 participants, I mean, that's amazing, for coming out and, uh, and listening to us. Thank you. Um, I think I'm next, if everyone can hear me okay. My name is Isabel Grant. 
my primary areas of research and, and teaching are in the area of criminal law. And I'd like to say to thank you to, to Deborah and to Chelsea for, for organizing this event. Um, I want to start by saying that feminism has been central to all of my work because what I'm going to say today is somewhat critical of some feminist um, thought. And I want to follow up on what Professor Arbel was talking about in terms of who is visible and who is not visible. And even feminism has a way to go um, in that respect. And I've been thinking about what to talk about um, you know, as we're all grappling with the impact of this pandemic and, and the isolation that that causes for us. And as I think about the pandemic, I think about how people with disabilities have been barely an afterthought in our response to this pandemic. Um, no group of people has been more impacted by the pandemic, and yet they've been at the bottom of the list in terms of priorities for government support, in terms of other services. So as I've been thinking about today, I thought I would talk about my work on feminism and disability, because I think that this is a group of, particularly when I talk about um, sexual assault, which is what I'm talking about, a group of women and girls who have been absent from much of the literature on sexual violence, feminist literature on sexual violence and how we respond to that. And I think I would go so far as to say that um, the disability scholars have, have done a better job of incorporating feminism sometimes into their analysis than, than some sort of mainstream feminist scholars have done, have done with disability theory. Um, and I think a sad truth is that women, particularly women with mental disabilities, which is the area I've looked at in my research. So when I use the language mental disability, I'm just using the umbrella term that is referred to in the charter and human rights legislation. And it encompasses within it intellectual disability, psychiatric disability, neurodegenerative disabilities. It's just kind of a, a, an umbrella term that's used to describe people who have a range of disabilities. And, and when I think about sexual violence against this group of women, I think it's important to note that, of course, you cannot compartmentalize disability any more than you can other aspects of someone's identity. So obviously, in the context of sexual violence, gender intersects with disability. But women with disabilities may well be indigenous or racialized or have disproportionately grown up in state care or and are, in fact, overwhelmingly more likely to be poor unemployed, homeless, have less access to reproductive choice and sexual autonomy than other, than other women, and are overwhelmingly targeted for male violence by a range of people in their lives, from family members to spouses and boyfriends and physicians and caregivers, and by the whole web of, of people who are apparently in service providing roles to, to people with disabilities. So it was about a decade ago that um, now Dean Benedet and I decided we wanted to try to address some of the gap in this, liter in this literature. And we thought, well, we'll write one paper on this and that will somehow you know, give us great insight on how to resolve some of these problems. We knew that um, from statistics that this group of women are vastly overrepresented as victims of sexual violence and yet they were largely absent from the case law and from the feminist scholarship we were reading about sexual assault. Our mistake, I guess, was thinking that we could do that in one paper. And if you fast forward between then and now, um, over the last 10 years, we've written about 10 papers on this topic. And, and we still have the sense that we've only scratched the surface. And just on a personal level, my, my understanding of sexual violence and of feminism have been profoundly shaped by doing this work. Um, the facts of these cases and the way these complainants are treated by the men who abuse them and by the legal system, when they turn to that legal system to have the violence against them recognized, will stay with me in my mind for the rest of my life. Um, and while the costs of sexual violence are enormous for all complainants, these complainants in particular pay a very heavy price for bringing forward allegations of sexual violence. Many of them lose whatever freedom they had in their lives. Sometimes they lose homes in the community. They lose inclusion in mainstream society generally. 
So the costs to this group of women are really quite significant um, for coming forward from sex regarding sexual violence. And if you look at what the data tells you on this area, you see that perpetrators are very well aware that this group of complainants will be less likely to come forward and report the abuse, less likely to be taken seriously by the police when they do report it, less likely to be able to testify in court, have more difficulty standing up to the whacking of complainants that we see in cross-examination, more likely to have their sexual histories and mental health records uh, introduced as evidence, and less likely to be believed by judges and juries in the rare cases that even get that far. And another thing I think our, our research showed us was the role of experts in the lives of, of these women. Um, prosecutions of sexual assault can involve grave invasion of any complainant's privacy, but that's particularly true when that complainant has a disability. We allow expert evidence to demean a complainant's credibility by simultaneously portraying her as childlike and yet as desperate for male attention. Their mental health records, their sexual histories, all the intimate details of their lives are, are presented to the court. Their understanding of sex, their ability to engage in basic personal hygiene, all of those kinds of personal details about their lives become fodder for defense counsel. Even our very definition of consent, which is whether a person wanted the sexual activity to take place, doesn't work well in many of these cases. Does a woman want the sexual activity to take place when she's only acquiesced to it because she, was, she is afraid, for example, that she will lose access to services or access to the community? And I know it's controversial to talk about criminalizing um, anyone at this point in time because the very legitimacy of our criminal justice system is deservedly under scrutiny. And it's important to highlight, of course, that people with mental disabilities are not only victims, they are also over-criminalized and over-incarcerated at a disproportionate rate. And we've had to grapple with those tensions between, between uh, women with disabilities as, as victims of violence, but also as potentially over-criminalized and over-incarcerated. But I do want to say that as long as we have a criminal justice system at all that thinks that male violence against women needs to be recognized, we can't pick and choose who are the worthy victims of that violence and who are not. And that um, women and girls with mental disabilities have the same hopes and dreams as everyone else and the same sexual desires as other adults. And yet, unless we can do something to deal with the epidemic of violence against them, they will not be included as full members of our community. And I just wanted to say really quickly at the end, and then I will pass it on, that um, amazing feminist students, a couple of former students I see on this call today, have really played a vital role in my work, both as, as students doing directed research and as student research assistants. So I did want to encourage students who are interested in some of these issues to reach out and make a connection, whether that's just to talk about these issues or to ask um, about possible work avenues for themselves. Thank you, and I will pass it on to my colleagues. Oh, hi. So I wanted to begin by thanking Deborah and Chelsea for organizing this event. I'm really grateful to be joining so many thoughtful and wonderful colleagues on this panel today. Um, my name is Bethany Hasty. I'm an assistant professor here at the Faculty of Law and I research in the areas of labor, employment and human rights law. So in thinking about today, we were invited to you know, ponder the question, how does feminism uh, inform our research and our thinking on law? And so for me, I, I, I like to begin by contrasting uh, my approach clearly with legal formalism, where my research is animated instead by a concern about the ways in which seemingly neutral legal principles uh, both shape and reflect relationships and circumstances of inequality. So as Professor As Affolder uh, mentioned at the start of her talk, this invites us to consider, for example, whose account or perspective matters, who's heard, uh, whose story is reflected in law. 
And one of my current research projects investigates sexual harassment complaints in human rights law. So I thought that would be an appropriate um, topic to talk about for this panel. So the legal principles governing sexual harassment complaints were set out 30 years ago in a Supreme Court of Canada decision where the court in Janssen and Platy Enterprises defined sexual harassment as unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature that detrimentally affects the working environment. And so from that, we can really distill three essential elements that complainants must establish in a case of sexual harassment, that there was conduct of a sexual nature, that the respondent knew or ought to have known that conduct was unwelcome, and the conduct produces adverse job-related consequences for the complainant. So a lot of my current work is really centered on uh, investigating and unpacking the second element, uh, that the respondent knew or ought to have known that the conduct was unwelcome. And this test can, in some circumstances, be assessed on an objective basis. That's the inclusion of that ought to, that the respondent ought to have known their, or their conduct was unwelcome. So therefore, that brings into play this idea of the reasonable person standard. And like other areas of law that adopt a reasonable person standard, this raises the question of social position, right? Who is the objective reasonable person whose perspective will be used to assess whether the conduct was unwelcome? And how can an adjudicator approach that question uh, through an impartial lens? In my research, I document the ways in which this test or this element of sexual harassment complaints in particular place an inappropriate burden on a complainant who's most often a woman to in, in effect disprove consent when she has been subject to sexually harassing conduct by the respondent who is most often a man. And I trace three key gender-based myths that operate to produce this, uh, this situation uh, in the case law. First, that uh, the first myth is that a woman who's experiencing sexual harassment will actively protest or object to the conduct. So this myth directly operates to undermine a complainant's assertion that the conduct was unwelcome in the absence of her ability to marshal clear evidence of that active protest. And this is so despite the fact that individuals may not actively protest or object to sex sexually harassing conduct in the workplace for a number of reasons, including out of a fear for repercussions, especially if there's a power imbalance between the parties to the incident. The second gender-based myth is that a quote unquote real victim of sexual harassment would promptly report her experience to relevant authorities. And this similarly, again, operates to undermine a complainant's assertion that the conduct was unwelcome if she delayed reporting or failed to report her experience to a relevant authority such as the manager. Again, this myth operates despite the fact that similar to a lack of protest in the moment, individuals we know may not report experiences of sexual harassment in the workplace for a number of reasons. Uh, including a fear of not being believed or a fear, again, of negative job-related consequences, consequences such as termination. Now, the third myth centers on a complainant's own behavior. So where a woman has engaged in similar or related behavior or other sexual behavior in the workplace in the past, such as by dressing provocatively or flirting, that this is sometimes used by respondents as evidence that it was therefore reasonable for them to believe that she welcomed the impugned conduct. So in other words, under this myth, a complainant's past behavior makes her both more likely to consent and less worthy of belief, similar to uh, remarks that Professor Grant uh, made in her talk. Now, each of these myths operate not only to undermine the complainant's credibility and her ability to establish that the conduct was unwelcome, but they suggest a presumption of consent. So this effectively requires the complainant to actively disprove consent or to establish non-consent, rather than requiring a respondent to establish that they had reason to believe that there was affirmative consent operating in the situation. So when we return to the legal principle and ask about the social position of the reasonable person whose interests is be, are being advanced, in its current formulation, this unwelcome test under the sexual harassment law privileges the respondent's position and interests over the complainant. And again, given that in most cases of sexual harassment, the complainant is female and the respondent is male, this directly operates, therefore, to entrench gender inequality, both in the law and in the workplace. 
These myths perpetuate the notion that it's a woman's responsibility to avoid harassment in the workplace rather than placing responsibility with those who would engage in harassment not to do so. And this burden of responsibility to avoid harassment is then compounded by the burden of having to es essentially disprove consent in order to establish that the conduct wasn't welcome if she brings a sexual harassment complaint. Again, rather than requiring a respondent to establish affirmative consent or a reasonable belief in it, such as exists, though imperfectly, in criminal and tort law. Uh, but I can include, or I can conclude, pardon me, on an optimistic or, or cautiously optimistic note today about the, the potential for law to change if slowly, if incrementally. And very recent legal developments in the area of sexual harassment law and human rights law are in fact indicating a possible shift away from this positionality in relation to the unwelcome standard. So in a recent decision, the BC Human Rights Tribunal took judicial notice of the three myths that I discussed today. And they used this judicial notice of these, of these myths to reformulate the reasonable person test in sexual harassment complaints as what would reasonable people who have taken the trouble to inform themselves on the topic of gender myths and stereotypes know about the types of interactions that occurred. So this provides a clear basis upon which the adjudicator can reject evidence and arguments that rely on gender-based myths or stereotypes. And as such, reframing the reasonable person as one who is informed about gender myths and stereotypes can work towards ameliorating that structural inequality that previously adhered to the unwelcome test, as I explore in my work, um, through those supposedly neutral legal principles. And so I think that brings me about to time. Um, so of course, if you have an interest in this, um, please feel free to reach out to me by email, or I'm happy to answer uh, Q&A. And um, please also feel free to consult my research report on this topic on the Allard Research Commons. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bethany, and to everyone else, uh, all my wonderful colleagues who have spoken already and will, uh, and Janice, who will speak after me. Um, so uh, I've already introduced myself, so I'll just uh, launch right in and say um, my work turns uh, an intersectional, anti-carceral feminist lens on the law and practice of punishment in Canada. So I study incarceration and um, often bring a particular focus on um, women's prisons, but I um, uh, do work um, examining punishment, sentencing, and incarceration across a whole range of, of, um, sort of more specific topics. Um, and I just want to say a few words today about where my research on imprisonment and prisoners' rights, combined with my feminist commitments and particular focus on women's prisons, where does that take me? What research questions animate my work? Um, before I, I get right into that, let me just acknowledge and thank um, the women and non-binary people whom I have met in women's prisons in particular across the country as I've done my work over the past 20 years. I have learned uh, an incredible amount from those engagements and from those individuals, many of whom are now in the community and um, I maintain contact with and learn from. Um, my interest in women's prisons began uh, at UBC Law School. Um, almost 25 years ago. Um, in Michael Jackson, who's um, uh, my colleague who is now Professor uh, Emeritus, in his uh, penal policy class, prison law class, back in 1996. Um, as many of you know, um, some of you don't know, Michael is the first professor to offer a prison law class um, in Canadian law school. And I took that course and I became immediately interested in prisoner rights uh, issues, not something that I had come to law school to study. I wanted to know more about women's prisons in particular. I ended up writing my paper for that course on the policy at the time of incarcerating uh, women designated maximum security in segregated units inside men's maximum security prisons. Then as now, some quite horrifying things are done in the institutions that carry out our sentencing principles. The system um, that implements these principles that we take for granted, I would argue, um, concepts such as deterrence, denunciation, rehabilitation. A number of the research questions that prompted my first uh, project in that penal policy class still animate my work. And let me just try to share my screen here for a second. <clears throat> 
So um, these are some of the questions. And obviously, in my short period of time, I'm not going to delve into all of them. But the kinds of things that I ask in my work are about what we can learn from the criminal punishment system by turning our lens on women's prisons and listening to incarcerated women. What are some of the implications of the ways we use incarceration to respond to interpersonal violence and harm? What rights do incarcerated people have and how are they enforced? What role do law and lawyers and legal strategies play in changing or challenging our society's use of incarceration? And what happens, this is my sort of, my kind of current focus in my work, what happens when we turn an anti-carceral feminist lens on our most serious offense, on the offense of murder? and the mandatory life sentence in particular. So let me just say that by turning our lens on women's prisons, I think we see a number of things. We see that women are the fastest growing prison population in Canada and internationally. In the last 10 years, the number of women sentenced to federal prison time, two years or more, has increased by um, more than 40%. In some provinces, such as Manitoba, where I spent 15 years of my academic career, the number of uh, incarcerated women has increased by nearly 250% in the last roughly decade. Fully one third of federal uh, women prisoners are indigenous and over la the last decade, the number of indigenous women serving federal sentences increased by 110%. Indigenous women represent the fastest growing category of prisoners. The numbers are more shocking even when you look at young people Fully 53% of all girls in the youth system of detention are Indigenous. Uh, in some provinces like Saskatchewan and Man Manitoba, they are virtually all Indigenous. So this amounts to Indigenous mass incarceration. Um, punishment in Canada is gendered and racialized. And let me just um, uh, do a little shout out to one of my colleagues, um, uh, Professor Arbel, who's done some work on um, the language we use around the crisis of Indigenous mass incarceration and the crisis of, of, of imprisonment. And I've learned an incredible amount from that piece. So you can find it if you Google for that piece. It's, um, it really, I think, is challenging in terms of how we talk about when we see, um, and I think the, the, there's no, um, it's an apt term to talk about Indigenous mass incarceration. Um, what underlies that? How is the law implicated in that? And what are we doing by talking about it as a crisis? And how, how, might, um, how might our work um, be informed by challenging that? Um, I'll just say that when we turn our lens on women's prisons, we also see clearly the victimization, criminalization continuum. And this is something that feminists have been um, talking about for some time. In our law and, and in our society, we generally put victims and offenders in discrete categories. One is deserving of our empathy and support and help, although we don't always offer it, and the other is deserving of our punishment and blame and subject to harm at the hands of the state. Incarcerated women have experienced ex extreme levels of violence and marginalization, yet when we insist on the offender identity and make women responsible for their own victimization, um, particularly women, Indigenous women and trans folk who've used violence and have been criminalized for it, as Professor Barkaskis was talking about it, um, their own experiences of violence and victimization are diminished, distorted, and disappeared. They are instead um, simply seen as criminals who should be punished. When we turn our lens on women's prisons, we see clearly the futility of abstracting interpersonal violence from structural and state violence. And what do I mean by structural violence? Well, I mean entrenched and institutionalized inequality, injustice manifest in policies that keep people in poverty, homeless, unsafe, institutionalized, and the avoidable impairment of fundamental human needs. And what do I mean by state violence? Well, I mean violence enacted by the state or its arms and bodies, police, prisons, Indian agents, social workers. Um, and there's much that we can learn by going into the prisons and meeting the women and, and trans and non-binary people incarcerated there. I've had the opportunity to do that with a number of, of um, uh, uh, advocates over the years with my classes. Obviously right now we're not going into prisons, but we are bringing people with um, experiences of incarceration into our Zoom class. Um, and, uh, and when we, when we turn our lens specifically on people serving life sentences, which is what I'm doing, um, right now in my work, I think we need to complicate some of our, um, analyses around, um, thinking about violence and how, uh, we punish violence in our, um, 
in our society and in our law. Um, finally, when we turn our lens on women's um, imprisonment, we see clearly the violence of incarceration itself. And um, oops. I'm gonna stop sharing now, or I'm not very um, technologically um, adept. Um, I, I want to acknowledge um, the, uh, my colleague Isabel Grant, who's working with me right now on a piece around um, trying to uh, see what's going on in murder sentencing and bringing an intersectional feminist lens to the reality that right now we have um, um, many, many um, more people be, um, being sentenced to life imprisonment um, for and serving longer periods of their life sentences before being released on parole. Those are disproportionately Indigenous um, people and particularly women. And we're um, looking at what it means to, um, uh, to, to, to truly um, examine the, um, the impact of life sentences. And if we brought those insights into our policy, what would it, what would it look like? And would we have the same sentencing policies that we have and I would argue that we wouldn't intend that we ought to abolish um, uh, life sentences and that's a place for us to, to, to begin in terms of unraveling some of the harms of incarceration and um, somewhat controversially I think I argue that we ought to start with life sentences rather than starting with nonviolent. doesn't mean we shouldn't also um, attend to the harms of um, incarceration for um, sort of low level or nonviolent offenses we ought to do that, and we are, I think, attending to that, but it's often more controversial to think about what it means to abolish the life sentence. So I'm happy to talk, take up that more in, in questions, but um, I want to uh, leave some time for um, my colleague, uh, Jenna Sarah, and then also for uh, Q&A time. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Chelsea, for organizing this. Um, and I want to start also by acknowledging that we're on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. And I'm coming from Bowen Island here, which is uh, where I live. Um, my work is slightly different than the presentations you've heard uh, before this. I work in uh, corporate law, corporate finance, financial institutions, banking law, commercial insolvency law, these are my absolute passions. Um, and I can say that as a feminist. Uh, but I'll also say, and this may be where some of um, the audience, some of the participants here are coming from, it was my feminism that brought me to the law, not the other way around. And so I actually don't remember when exactly, but I can tell you that 45 years ago, I was working as a community organizer for racialized women in the garment trades and the retail trades. And uh, they were facing profound racial and sexual harassment uh, and obviously minimum wage, et cetera. And I did a lot of work there. And, uh, and then the second thing I'll just note is that I worked really hard also almost 40 years ago to legalize abortion. I was uh, on the core committee supporting Morgenthaler all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And one of my recollections is sitting in the hospital with my daughter who's now 38, handing out tickets for a fundraising benefit and having um, a confrontation with the hospital administrator about my right to be actually organizing a pro-choice event while sitting in a hospital after having had a baby. Um, so all of these things um, led me to think there was, um, that I needed to know more about the law and that, I, and that law was going to be a tool. And I will tell you that I started law school later in life, I was, uh, vice chair of the first Ontario Pay Equity Hearings Tribunal. I was the only non-lawyer vice chair. And it seemed to me that in all of these experiences, the law had its limits, but it also had its, its potential. So I went to law school as a mature student backwards and um, thought I would do human rights and equality law. And by the time I finished, I thought there are lots of amazing feminists and there's no one in these hardcore business law areas that is going to bring, and there wasn't much at the time. There are many, many more now a feminist lens to corporate law, financial services law, et cetera. So that's sort of my coming to law from feminism as opposed to the other way around. So let me just spend the last of my time to tell you about two things I've been working on recently, which I think are kind of reflective of the kind of work I do. Uh, the first is I do a lot of work in financial services, global financial markets, what goes wrong, what regulatory oversight should there be, and I recently did a collaborative project with my friend and colleague out of New York, Cheryl Wade, 
And we've published a book very recently called Predatory Lending and the Destruction of the African-American Dream. And it really does an empirical and normative uh, analysis of the global financial crisis 10 years ago. And fast forward 10 years out, where are we? And what harm has been caused? And we document basically the 17 million foreclosures that happened in the United States since that time. What happened in the financial system that particularly targeted Black Americans four times more likely to receive subprime mortgages uh, than others in America, and what that has meant for them on a continuing basis. Uh, the book also talks about how predatory lending is continuing in all sorts of forms. And so what we, what we did was, between us, we used an intersection of financial services theory, critical race theory, and feminist legal theory to sort of analyze the issues and then make a series of policy recommendations. And so that's been a very um, fruitful collaboration with someone who I've known for 20 years. Uh, it took us a while to get to where we wanted to be in terms of the analysis. And we're carrying on work now with thinking about the new forms of predatory lending that are coming out of COVID and, and what that means for racialized people in the United States. Um, the other big project that's been my passion for the last six or seven years is climate change and corporate governance. Um, I have the great fortune to collaborate with people right across the world on this subject. And it really is um, taking it from a corporate lens and an institutional investor lens and trying to persuade courts through uh, everything from research on duty of care and fiduciary obligation through to educating uh, corporate boards and pension boards on what their obligations are in terms of trying to decarbonize the world. And again, this has been a very fruitful collaboration. Um, it's not just straight corporate board message. I really bring, I think, feminist lens to it. I also bring a fair bit of um, collaboration with scholars in South Africa and other places about how women are not at the policy table around climate change governance. Uh, why they're, you know, they're, they're, um, the lack of representation by women and racialized people on pension boards uh, and on corporate boards uh, means that the conversation about climate change, especially in this country, has not advanced to where it should be. And so a lot of energy on both the research but also the organizing. Uh, we've had the good fortune to get funding for the next three years from five foundations. Um, I'm happy to report 675,000, which was a real coup for us to go out and actually deploy a whole bunch of volunteers to try and ramp up and really change the dial on the way in which corporations and institutional investors in this country uh, are really committed to combating climate change um, and to doing it in a way that uh, protects jobs, uh, creates a circular economy, and really, really moves us in a meaningful way away from fossil fuel dependency. So those are just two examples of recent work. Uh, and I think that I will say for those of you that will end up in the corporate world or in securities or banking law is there is so much room to bring a feminist analysis and a feminist advocacy because it's been a male um, dominated place uh, for a long time. So I'm really honored and privileged to be here. Thank you. Wow. Um, so, and as, as I mentioned at the outset, that is only, um, there's eight of us <laughs> all together here, but that's, you know, like basically a third of the uh, scholars that are associated with the center. Um, and so we can have further events in the future. You can go to the um, Allard Research Commons, um, the Center for Feminist Legal Studies website, where we have a list of the faculty um, and links to their profiles that are associated with the center. There are many scholars across the country doing this work, including a few who've joined us um, here today. Um, I want to open it, open it up to some questions. And I have, um, so there's already been a, a few, I think I've got three questions that I've kept track of from the chat. But please, if you have questions, um, please go ahead and type them into the chat. We have some time. We're going to close this down for sure at um, 1.45 to allow people to get to their next um, to classes and teaching and that sort of thing. Um, uh, we are, of course, recording it for people later, too. Um, but um, I want to um, identify the questions that I've seen so far and um, put them out to some of the panelists. There was a question about um, uh, um, our folks um, collaborating with the Gender, Race, Sexuality, Social Justice uh, uh, Department at 
at UBC. And um, I can say, uh, I can't speak for everybody. Um, I can say that actually the CFLS has an event where we are collaborating with um, GRSJ coming up, as well as we're collaborating with Indigenous Legal Studies and with um, the Shirley Green Greenberg Chair in Women in the Legal Profession at Ottawa U for a book launch of a new colleague who is joining, a uh, book of, by a new colleague who is joining us in January, um, um, October 14th, uh, Chelsea's just posting the information in the chat, um, called Revolutionary Feminisms. Uh, it's a launch of, of a book that contains interviews with um, a number of, um, some very well known, some uh, maybe lesser known, um, anti-racist feminists. And so um, that's gonna be a really exciting collaboration. But on, the que on this question of collaboration more generally, um, you heard already a little bit um, from a few panelists about collaboration that they do with other, um, with other colleagues, um, sometimes with um, uh, an interdisciplinary uh, collaborations with folks in other disciplines, um, with lawyers, with community members, with community groups. And I'm wondering if anybody who hasn't yet spoken to that would like to speak to the role of collaboration uh, in their, or, or anyone who has already too, and elaborate, but on the role of collaboration in your work. Deborah, I'm happy um, to jump in because I think there was um, quite a powerful message that came across in a lot of the talks about um, one of the costs of being a feminist scholar, which is you can't unsee the things you've seen. And I think many people gave us examples of that. And I think, you know, we did it with our, without our voices breaking. Uh, which uh, maybe is just a learned skill because I think uh, the realities that a number of people were speaking to um, are reasons why their work um, comes at tremendous personal cost. And so linking from that to the collaboration point that is really an excellent point about um, feminist scholarship, I think it's our collaborators that keep us going. It's the fact that um, these personal costs are things that we can share with the very supportive community um, and that we're not just sitting doing this work uh, in a silent um, room or an echo chamber where we only hear ourselves um, that allows many of us to do the work we do. I can say speaking um, personally, one of the most inspiring and uplifting aspects of feminist collaborative work that helps balance the really dismal reality of working on issues like climate change, which Janice talked about, which are, you know, really dreadful and constantly depressing, is that you get to meet um, feminists and post-colonial scholars from other parts of the world who can draw on non-Western experiences of, say, human nature relationships that are optimistic and cheery so I think um, we, we work together for many reasons, but um, working with others allows us to um, see in another day. And Patricia, I think you wanted to get in. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that and say that, you know, I have the opportunity, I mean, most of my work is collaborative. I, I tend to co-author with people, uh, including my students. I work really hard to um, make sure that I'm, I'm collaborating on a lot of different things with people in the faculty. You know, Bethany and I have done some collaborative work. Alex and I have done some. You know, I, I really am excited by those opportunities and, you know, they do keep us going, as you just said, right? Um, but I was, just, I was just recalling something really important that recently um, I heard Tracy Lindbergh say in a meeting of Indigenous women who were collaborating on some justice issues. Um, and, you know, she said that we do this, we, we do this thing that people call labor, right? So the, the unseeing, that not being able to unsee the things that we see and in doing this, you know, what people often call emotional labor or um, social justice labor. She said, I really want to be clear about the fact that this is leadership work. What we're doing is feminist leadership. And I thought that was such a powerful, poignant statement that I wanted to share it because it is true, you know, and, and I look at all of you and the incredible work that you do. And I just think, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Can I, Deborah, just add one thing? I just want to say that I think also um, it's not just um, 
it's not just legal collaboration, but it is really insights from other disciplines that can be profoundly important. Um, something I did though, a couple of weeks ago was we uh, worked out of the University of Johannesburg and asked um, uh, graphic arts students to give us their vision for climate change and a, and a green recovery. And there was this amazing competition and then we featured the 15 um, best on a webinar and their messages and their stories from their realities in the townships was just thought provoking, deeply thought provoking in terms of just trying to understand the different frame that different disciplines and different people are coming from. And uh, as some of my colleagues will know and laugh at me, I've used dance and music and foreclosure follies and art. And I think maybe it's just the state of life, the stage of life I'm in. But I think that's another part of what Natasha says is it is the part that keeps you going and you can have a bit of fun while still recognizing the seriousness. And I think interdisciplinary work does that more than almost anything. <laughs> need to unmute myself. Um, yeah, thanks for that. And there was a, and we can maybe pick up on that again if, if we want to, but I wanted to get to the next question, which was um, for Professor uh, Arbel, and it's about immigration detention and, you know, it, and the work that you're doing there and is what you're seeing um, not enough law to protect, I think the question is around not enough law to protect folks who are um, in those places of detention or is it something else or, or what are you seeing in terms of the concerns uh, that you've identified around immigration detention? Thanks. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent question and I could speak to it uh, for hours, but uh, given the time constraint, I'll try to be brief. Um, it's a combination of too much law and not enough law. And I think what it boils down to is um, law being um, poorly thought out and inappropriately applied. So in my work, I argue that immigration detention is actually governed by um, a governance of trauma, that it implements trauma as a form of government, or sorry, governance. Um, the violations or the violence that I speak of um, occur as a trajectory, and it really is a trajectory of violence from the moment of arrest and detention all throughout the time of detention. And violations can occur in a, uh, can occur in a variety of different ways. So they can be procedural, um, for example, mandatory strip searching. Um, they can be penal, for example, um, solitary confinement. Uh, they can be structural, so the uh, process uh, through which detainees go through uh, mandatory review um, and um, the, the mechanisms by which they can argue for release can themselves be um, instances of violence. So um, I, guess, I guess I would sum it up by saying that, that immigration detention really is a trajectory of violence and that it is um, a, a product of the law being poorly thought out, poorly implemented, and simultaneously too much of it in certain situations and not enough of it in others. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll just say that we do have a, um, oh, actually we are at 147. So actually we do have to wrap up. I thought, I thought we had more time. So I think we are going to have to um, uh, call it there. I completely lost track of time because I'm so interested in what my colleagues are saying. Um, I will then just say thank you all for joining us. We will get this, um, the, the recording posted up on our website in due course and I'll probably include a little transcription of what I said at the beginning in case that's just to put it in some context. So I think we forgot to start recording until a bit later, which is totally fine. Um, but uh, yeah, we plan to have some other events coming up. Check out our website, Facebook, Twitter. Um, we, uh, we do want to welcome whoever wants to, to be part of our, our sessions that we're going to be holding in this Zoom world um, for the next while. So please uh, do uh, connect and, and join us. And thank you all for coming today. And thanks to my wonderful colleagues for sharing their time and their research.